Okay. Um, so let's see. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everyone had a good uh, spring break. And um, I have um, the whatever the first uh, order of business is that I got uh, I got a request to extend the deadline uh, for an extension on the assignment, so I decided to extend it for everyone by two days. So the assignment originally due at midnight tonight will be due at midnight Thursday night. Um, are there any questions, problems, difficulties before we get going? Okay, um, so let me share a screen then. Um, so, uh, shoot, that's better. So I think I owe you the proof of a theorem. And um, so the theorem had to do with internal energies of the form, well, how to write it. So U mu is defined as the integral over Rn of U of rho x uh, dn x, where um, mu is absolutely continuous with respect to volume, and rho is the density of mu, the Lebesgue density. And um, so the theorem was something like, if you sort of a, uh, satisfies uh, lambda goes to lambda n one over sorry u over lambda one over lambda n is convex non increasing then. Um, uh, what's the best way to write it? then uh, t in zero one goes to u of mu t is convex along any d2 geodesic in the set of Borel probability measures on Rn, which are absolutely continuous. Um, they better have, have second moments and be absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Uh, I mean, you don't really need the second moments condition, but it, it helps for making sense of what a G2 geodesic is. And I had um, what I had argued last class was that this is a kind of internal, I mean, you can think of here, this is a kind of internal energy for a gas with density rho. And um, we we talked about the what an interaction energy would look like, and the inter, and also a potential energy for interaction with the background field. So a self self interaction, a quadratic contribution of through a pairwise potential W, and uh, one particle interaction with the background field V. And we saw that convexity of W and V were enough to have um, convexity of the inter, the potential energies along these D two geodesics. And so what it was left to show was that the um, that this the, these conditions, oh, um, I didn't say what happens at zero. So u of zero, let's make u of zero zero. And this is lambda um, lambda is a positive number here. And what I checked was, uh, I recall I also showed that um, um, if u is a power, like rho to the m over m minus one, and m is bigger than one minus one over dimension, it satisfies. It satisfies this criterion.
And the critical case, actually you can do it for any power, but in particular, we saw that the critical case, m equals one minus n, this uh, d2 geodesic or so-called displacement convexity, right? It's, it's convexity with respect to displacements of the gas. We saw that that implied the brunman minkowski inequality, which was a kind of backwards triangle inequality for the and through to the volumes of sets in Rn under Minkowski or linear combination. Questions? So I still I still owe you the proof of this theorem. And there's two main ingredients that go into the proof. Um, the first one is um, uh, two things. Uh, well, the characterization of D2 geodesics um, if let's say d mu t equals well, if d mu t, if if mu t is a d two geodesic, in uh, you, you need at least one of the endpoints to be absolutely continuous. Then, uh, as long as one of the endpoints is absolutely continuous, then both, then the the entire inter in the entire interior of the geodesic is also absolutely continuous. So, um, so in fact, let me take this out and add with um, mu zero absolutely continuous with respect to the big volume. Then, um, then mu t is absolutely continuous. For all t less than one, and its density rho t, which is the um, satisfies rho t of g t of x is given by rho naught, a kind of Monge pair equation of determinant of dgt of x almost everywhere where um where gt of x is one is the linear interpolation between the identity map and brenier's convex gradient map and so this this equality this almost everywhere equality uh you can so i proved something like this in my phd thesis but uh so my proof is contained in Villani's first book it takes about three pages. He calls it tedious. He says it's tricky, but tedious or something like that. Tricky, tedious, but tricky. Um, and then a more general proof. So in his second book, he states this kind of theorem without proof, but in more generality for more general cost functions. And he cites works of books of Ambrosio basically for, for proving this in general. And um, so let me give Say Villani 2003 as a reference. And the other ingredient is the co-area formula. So G is countably Lipschitz. So the area co-area formula. So those are the ingredients um, that we're gonna use. And so now let me try to write, write a, an actual proof. So the, here's the proof. So the, the actual proof uh, we want to evaluate u at mu t, and by the things that I just said, that's the integral over Rn of u of rho t of, uh, maybe I should call it y, dny. And then I use the area or co area formula due to a change of variables. It's, they're the same because the mapping G takes, I can use either area or courier because G takes Rn to Rn. So it's the same dimension. And um, then this becomes uh, Rn U of rho of T, G T of X, uh, Jacobian derivative. So determinant of D G T of X.
And you might put absolute values in here, but it doesn't really matter because G, even GT is gradient of a convex function. And so it's Jacobian derivative is positive definite. And then I use this Mongem, I substitute this Mongem pair type equation. And I get um, that this is integral of u of rho zero over the same Jacobian determinant. Great. And so then I wouldn't just want to think about the integrand for a second. So I can write the integrand um, as a composition of two functions, right? It's like f composed with g, where f, I guess, is a function of like rho rho and I don't know what to call it, uh, lambda, is lambda to the n u of rho over lambda to the n. And g is uh, g lambda. Um, I guess g of t is the nth root of determinant of one minus t identity plus t second derivative of a convex function. So recall that uh, recall that uh, g t of x was one minus t of x plus t d u. And so it's Jacobian derivative looks like, looks like this. And and so, and now I, I want to argue that the integrand is a convex function of t. If the integrand is a convex function of t, then I integrate it, I get a convex function of t. And recall, we also showed that um, that on 0, 1, because this matrix is positive definite because of the convexity of u, um, g is concave. That we showed last class, that was the kind of the algebraic analog of the brin minkowski inequality. And then by hypothesis, my hypothesis for the theorem is basically that f is a convex non-increasing function of Lambda in this formula. And then basically, when you compose a when you compose a concave function with one that's convex non-increasing, you get a convex function again. Uh, sorry. Right. And there, you know, there are different ways to see this, but if we wanted just to pretend everything was smooth for a second and take derivatives, um, you would see that if you take a derivative with respect to t of this expression, you get df d lambda g prime. And if you take a second derivative with respect to t of the same expression, you get second derivative of f with respect to lambda squared. Uh, g prime squared plus 
first derivative of f with respect to lambda g double prime. And so for f convex as a function of lambda, this is positive and the square is positive. And for f non-decreasing, this is negative and the concavity of g says this is negative. And so the whole thing adds up to something positive. Any questions? Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the displacement convexity of the entropy. And another, I, yeah, I don't know what to... So another way to think about this, the way I think about this is if you had a, a box full of gas at density rho, and then you allowed the walls of the box to move linearly in time, this, this internal energy is varying as a convex function of time. So that's the picture when you have a box at constant density. And then when you have two distributions at non-constant density and you're gonna do op optimal transport with respect to distance squared cost between them, uh, basically each, every point over here is contained in a ball, which is gonna go to some ellipse over here where the ratio, the, you know, this, the Hessian of U at X, the eigenvalues of the Hessian of U at X tell you the dimensions of this ellipse relative to this ball. And um, okay, the density isn't constant, but it's approximately constant on balls uh, because of, I don't know whose principal, Luzon or Littlewood's principal or whatever. And so this, this ball deforming to this ellipse is like the box with the linear sides varying. And so the contribution of the internal energy of this little part is a convex function of time. And then you add up all these little parts and they never cross each other in the middle because we already checked that uh, GT was, had an ellipsis inverse. So any two points here stay far away from each other in the middle, far enough away. They stay like distance one over T of their original distance from each other. I minus mean, one over one minus T because as T goes to one, they can converge to the same point. So that's somehow the picture that I have in mind that goes with the serum. Any questions? All right, so that's somehow the, uh, and so as a corollary of this in the interacting gas model, um, if U satisfies our hypothesis and um, let's say W is strictly convex, then that implies that the internal energy of U plus the potential energy of W is uniquely minimized up to translations. to translation on, let's say, the set of probability densities on Rn. You know, pro <laughs> okay, we, I guess we needed them to be, in, in this proof, we need them to be absolutely continuous and, uh, and have second moments, or maybe even compactly supported. And some variation of this argument was actually used. So I sort of sketched the brun minkowski inequality. So the brun minkowski inequality is actually one approach to showing the isoparametric theorem. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's good to recall. Um, the consequence of brun minkowski And I'm just, I'm gonna just give a heuristic argument. Um, so heuristically, if, um, what do we wanna show? So we have some set in Rn, A I guess, or K maybe. And we wanna relate its volume to its perimeter. And so one way to do this is to look at K plus a small ball of radius R. Right, so that builds a, a thin neighborhood. It enlarges K by distance R. And um, so you would expect that um, the perimeter of K times R should be roughly the difference between the volume, uh, let me call this KR. So 
like the volume of kr minus the volume of k, k0. So if, in fact, if I divide by r, if I divide both sides by r, then you would expect the equality to hold in the limit. So that's true. So this is, and this is like the, the Hausdorff n minus one dimensional measure of the boundary of k. And this is true if k is smooth enough. In other words, have smooth boundary. And otherwise, you sometimes define, some, you, you could make this like a limb soup or something and define that would be somebody's content. I don't know, the Minkowski content or something of the, the boundary of k. Um, and, but on the other hand, the, uh, what do we call it? The brun minkowski inequality tells us something. The brun minkowski inequality tells us that the volume of kr is bigger than the volume of k plus the volume of rb10, um, even after I take nth roots. This is the brun minkowski inequality. So, um, so let me call, I should give this some name. Um, oh, and what's the other thing? The other thing is that uh, this, when you take the nth root of the volume, it becomes homogeneous of degree r. So, so I, sh I should really give this some name. So let me call this function um, f of r. And so this is like f of zero and the r can come out of here, r volume, one over n b one zero, so the the volume of the unit ball, and so you can understand the Brun-Minkowski inequality as telling you something about the derivative of f, but right the Brun-Minkowski inequality tells you that f r minus f zero divided by r is bigger than the nth root of the volume of the unit ball. So the, again, if if k is smooth enough, this limit the limit will exist. derivative of f at zero plus. And here we're trying to compute, we're trying to compute the derivative with respect to r at zero plus of, I guess, the nth power of f. So like f of r to the n. But the chain rule tells us what that is. That's something like n times f of uh, zero to the n minus one, the derivative of f at zero. And so according to the brun minkowski inequality, that's bigger than n f0 to the n minus 1 volume 1 over n. Uh, and so finally, I conclude that the perimeter of k which was the n minus 1 measure of its boundary is, and f0 is the volume of k, is bigger than n the volume of k uh, to the power n minus one. So something's still slightly fishy here, but maybe it's okay. Yeah, maybe it's okay. Great. So basically we just got that the perimeter is controlled by the, oh yeah, sorry, f, this had an over n here. That's perfect, that looks better. f of zero is the nth root of the volume of k. So good. So we just got that we just got that h n minus one of the boundary of k is bigger than n times h n of k to the power n minus one over n volume one over n unit ball. And you can it's easy to check that when k is the unit ball equality holds here. And so that's the isoparametric theorem. So you see the brun minkowski inequality has isoparametric information in it and the displacement convexity of these internal energies has the brun minkowski inequality in it. So it also has isoparametric information. And in fact, um, in fact, about uh, 15 years ago, people were very interested in improvements of the what's called stability results for the isoparametric theorem. So stability results were like, 
if set uh, if k merely saturates produces equality here must k be close to a ball and in what sense or must a translate of k be close must um k be close to a ball and can you quantify and so people um so there was a, a well-known paper by Fusco Maggi and Pratelli that said something like if there so you can so there exists um so there exists a point in Rn well what, what do I want to say um so the symmetric difference between k and some ball of the appropriate radius is controlled by I won't get the formula right, but um, it's controlled by the difference between something like the difference between the right and the left hand side of the isoparametric theorem. This is all if k has the volume of the ball. So if volume of k equals the volume of the ball. Um, To a certain power, and I don't, I don't remember what the power was. I want to say maybe two or one half, and with a constant. So there exists a constant. So there exists a constant less than infinity, such that blah blah blah, that you can control, control this by the appropriate power of the what's called the isoparamic deficit. And uh, so um, Fusca and Maggi and Pratelli showed. I think this is a square, but don't quote me on this. Um, they showed that this was true for the, the isoparamic inequality using rearrangements. Um, and then uh, one of the things that Figali, the, the first big result that Figali got was with Maggi and Pratelli, and it showed that an analogous statement was true where you used, instead of the usual isoparametric energy, which just measures the area of the set K, where you used a direction dependent energy, which would be relevant if, you were, if K was instead of modeling, say, a liquid drop, which wants to be round, if it was modeling a crystal where uh, you have an underlying atomic structure, which makes it easier to have lower energy to have crystal planes in certain directions, not others. And so there, the analog of the isomerometric theorem in that context is called Wolf's inequality. And it says that if you know how the energy depends on the direction of the faces, then you can figure out what shape minimizes that energy for a given volume, and it will always be a convex shape. And more or less, you get it by Legendre transforming. So you take the energy as the function of the unit normal and you extend it to be a norm or at least linear homogeneous of degree one on Rn. And then the, you Lejeune transform that convex function and the, the, the set where the Lejeune transform vanishes is the shape that minimizes per unit volume the surface area. People wanted analogous kind of stability inequalities. Ideally with sharp exponents. Uh, I don't know what people know about the sharpness of the constant. And uh, so actually they used uh, Figali, the difference between Figali, Maggi, and Fratelli, and Fusco, Maggi, and Fratelli was that Figali, Maggi, and Fratelli used optimal transportation ideas. So they went back, I think, to the um, to the, the concavity of G in this discussion, and they tried to quantify. You know, if you showed that if if you if if asking you was not so, I think when asking you is a multiple of the identity matrix, then G is linear in T. And so whenever Hessian U is not a multiplied multiple of the identity matrix, G becomes strictly convex. And you can try to quantify how strictly convex G is in terms of how spread out the eigenvalues of the Hessian of U are. And so they use some quantitative statement at the level of this and integrated it up. And that tells you how, how much strict convexity you get out of G if, if the eigenvalues of U are spread out. And they integrated that up to get um, a stability and equality for the Wolf's, Wolf's theorem, although it also works for the isoparametric theorem. All right, great. So I think I've said probably about as much as I want to say about this um, displacement convexity of the internal energy. Um, I have another, a couple of topics. So it, maybe next week I'm going to talk about this, these using displacement convexity of this kind of energy in order to define 
Oh yeah, okay, so maybe I can say a bit more. <laughs> um, so if we went to the sphere instead of Rn, and we did optimal transportation between two probability measures on the sphere, the geodesics would try to tend to spread out in the middle. And so this kind of internal energy that I've been talking about would be even more convex on the sphere. If we went to a saddle or hyperbolic space and had two mass distributions and tried to do uh, construct the D2 Wasserstein geodesic between them, we'd find that geodesics are trying to concentrate in the middle of this saddle. And so you'd have something more sharply peaked and you'd have greater internal energy. So convexity would not hold in the saddle. And so it turns out that this um, convexity of U extends from Rn to a Ramanian manifold Mg if and only if the Ricci curvature of Mg is non-negative. So it works on the sphere, it doesn't work on the saddle or in hyperbolic space. And so the idea that I will hope to start to explore next week is how you can use convexity. So you can adopt, in other words, you can adopt the convexity of D2 of, of U along D2 geodesics can be used to define Ricci curvature for, or at least Ricci non-negativity for a manifold. And convexity, of, although Ricci curvature doesn't make sense for a metric space or a length space, convexity of U along D2 geodesics makes perfectly good sense. And you can take that to be your definition of what it means for a length space to have um, to have non-negative Ricci curvature. Well, okay, uh, so D2 geodesics make perfectly good sense in a length space. Uh, I haven't told you how would you define the entropy in a length space, but if you can define an entropy in a length space that reduces to this kind of entropy on Ramanian manifolds, then you can use such an entropy in order to talk about what it means for a length space or a metric space with geodesics to have Ricci non-negative curvature. Does that make sense? Before I do that, uh, I have another topic that I wanted to touch on this week, a couple of two or three related topics. So one of them, uh, I talk about an economic application called hedonic pricing. I will talk about, um, I will talk about Wasserstein, so D2 Berry centers or so-called so two Wasserstein Berry centers. So basically, um, our construction of geodesics was that if we have an initial and final measure, we can construct a curve of measures joining them. The idea of Wasserstein Berry centers, if you have three measures or more, so let's say you have three measures, you want to construct a triangle, a surface of measures joining them with uh, whose corners correspond to three given measures and points inside the triangle would represent uh, like convex, sort of convex combinations of the measures, but in the displacement sense. And I will talk, because, because it's linked, I'll talk to Wasserstein Berry centers, I'll talk a little bit about multi-marginal optimal transport, which is exactly instead of given two measures and finding the cheapest in a cost function on a product of two spaces, it would be given three or more measures and a cost function on a product of three or more spaces, finding a minimizing joint measure for these three or more measures under the constraint that the marginals project to the given measures, multi-marginal optimal transport. So these are the three topics I wanted to talk about this week. And so let me talk about, hedon let me start at uh, talking about hedonic pricing a little bit. Um, so this is an economic model um, for how supply and demand um, equilibrate to determine price. And, um, but it's in a market where uh, you, you're not really going to be buying many things. So it's think of the housing market. Most people are only interested in buying one house. Investors maybe are going to buy many houses, but most people are just interested in buying one house. Uh, many builders are only maybe selling one house at a time. So the housing market could be what's called a hedonic market, where you're not going to compensate for the quality of your house by buying more than one house. Um, Let's say that even maybe the new housing market, new house market. Um, and so the, here's there's different ways of formulating the model, but here's the model that I have in mind. Um, 
we're given three published spaces. I'll call them X, Y, and Z. And I guess I'll take them to be compact for simplicity as usual. Um, so this is going to represent uh, the space of houses. Oh, sorry. Z is going to represent the space of houses. Or let's say potential houses. Um, X is going to be the space of, bu of buyers. And Y is going to be the space of builders. And we're given uh, we're given a priori a Borel probability measure on X and Y. Uh, I guess I've been calling through most of the course I've been calling this like mu plus and mu minus, but um, we're not given a probability measure on the space of potential houses. So, in other words, what the preference of the buyers and the preference of the builders are going to determine what houses are actually built and how much is charged for them. And, but what, what, so what are we given? We're given the preferences. So um, we're also given A of XZ, which is like the value of a house of type Z to buyer type X. And we're also given the cost to YZ, which is the cost to the builder of building house Z. And so now we want to determine what houses are going to be built and who's going to sell which house to which, which builder is going to build which house and what buyer are they going to sell it to and how much is the buyer going to pay. Who will build what for whom? And um, how much will it sell for? And so one way to think about this problem is, well, I'm going to, so I'm, in other words, I'm seeking. So here's formulation one. I'm going to seek a measure omega on Z. Uh, and if I calculate the cost uh, of transporting nu onto omega, that'd be like the infimum or the minimum of the integral of C d gamma over gamma with marginals nu and omega, um, that would be like the, the minimum total cost it would take for our, our distribution of buyers nu to build a distribution of houses omega. And if I defined nu of A similarly, then nu of minus A um, mu omega, so, so this is like the cost for the minimal cost for a new to build distribution omega. And this is, this is like the maximal benefit omega provides to this distribution of buyers. Right, so if, if a distribution omega is built, then you're going to pair them up so to maximize the you're going to pair the buyers with the houses built so as to maximize a the integral of a against the joint measure. And so then we're going to seek omega, uh, probably to omega is going to be probably a maximizer. of W minus A of mu omega minus, uh, so that's one way to think of the problem. Uh, 
is I'm given new and new, and I'm looking for this third measure on houses, which maximizes the difference between the benefit and the cost. And this, you can, this, so you can almost see this is almost like a geodesic problem again, depending on if, if you, for the right choice of A and C, it's almost like you're given the endpoints mu and nu of a geodesic and you're trying to find the midpoint omega between the, those two endpoints. So another formulation would be, so in fact, let me push a little bit further. So this maximum that we looked at, the max over PZ, would be the same as maximizing over triple measures, gamma, non-negative on x cross y cross z such that um, you know the the marginal projection of gamma onto x should be mu and the marginal projection of gamma onto y should be nu and the marginal projection of gamma onto z is unconstrained and then it would be integral of uh, I guess minus a of xz plus c of yz d gamma xyz. So this is basically the same thing. I've, I've built the two minimizations uh, that define this and this into one step here. Okay, so now let, let me talk about form two. And then once you find once you find the maximizer gamma to this problem, you project it onto Z and that would give you the omega from the, all the, yeah, for every maximizer gamma, this problem projected onto Z would give you a maximizing omega in the previous problem. You know, actually I'm not that happy about, um, there's a sign problem here somewhere. Maybe it's, Maybe it's minus, maybe it's minus W of minus A, that's the maximal benefit. That sounds more likely. So I'm probably trying to maximize this. And so probably I end up with A minus C here. Good. Um, so form two is, Let's just um, imagine if if buyer Y if Y sells a house sells a house to X which house will it be what type of house will it be Can anyone see the answer to this question or guess the answer to this question? Like, will it be the one with the biggest difference between the value to the buyer um, no. and the like cost to the builder? Exactly. Yeah. So you expect it to be a house. You expect it to be one of the maximizers over capital Z of exactly A of X minus C of Y. And so you could define, you can define the benefit of X matching with Y to be exactly this maximum. And I wanna assume, I've assumed the spaces were compact already. I wanna assume these are continuous functions. 
because I don't have to worry about the maximum and things will go badly if the maxes are not attained. Um, so define a benefit B to be the maximum over Z of AXZ minus CYZ. And then, um, so I sort of, how could you sort of break it down into two steps. First, I figure out if, if Y is gonna sell to X, what kind of house is it gonna, that they're gonna sell? And then I try to figure out, how am I gonna figure out which builder is gonna match with which buyer? Which builder Y will match with which buyer X? Assuming that every builder is going to build just one house and every buyer is going to buy just one house. Yeah, right. So I see the answer from Joaquin in the chat. So um, that's determined by maximum of gamma with marginals mu and nu, integral b x y to gamma x y. So any maximizer here will give you a pairing of um, a pairing of buyers with builders, and then the maximum here will tell you which house each pair is going to agreed to trade up. And then we know that um, that this maximum is dual to a minimum, which is given by uh, you know the expected benefit to the buyers u plus the expected benefit to the builders v, where ux plus B, by dominates b of xy for stability. Otherwise, they wouldn't match with each other. Um, so form two kind of, you can see in form two, who's going to end up matching with whom and what house is going to be built. Um, and now, of course, what I also know about b is that b is bigger than a of xz minus C of YZ for every Z with equality at the house that's actually traded between X and Y. Um, and so I can rewrite this if I want putting all the Y's on one side and the X's on the other side. Um, so I would have something like, uh, I could rewrite this in the form U of X minus Uh, I don't know, maybe that's not the best form. Hang on. Let's maybe let's do it the other way. A of X Z minus U of X is less than um, VY minus CYX, CYZ rather. So I have this for all Z, for all X and Y. And in particular, so I would I could put a supremum over here in Z. Uh, is that what I want to do? Or maybe I want to do supreme in X. Yeah, right, supreme in X. That'll still be less than this. And I could do infimum and Y over here. And so that means that I can, I can stick some P in between here. Because this supremum is dominated by this infimum, there's a P in between here. And then and probably maybe more than one p, but um, so I claim that p is the price of house that the price that house z will change for trade for. And if there's some space between here, then there'd be a range of prices that that house could trade for. Um, but there won't be a range on the houses that are actually traded. There will be a range of so there are some houses that will never be built, and they might have a range of potential prices for which they'll never be built. Um, Sorry, Robert, 
Isn't yep. it pl plus C? Yeah, right. Like you just take Maybe. C to the yeah, other plus side. C. Thanks, thanks. Um, so, but uh, okay. So let me try to let me try to uh, see if this makes sense. Um, right. So let me let me go back and try to interpret this inequality. These this chain of inequalities: a x y z minus u x less than p z less than v y plus c x y. Um, so on this, what this inequality says is that um, the price will be at least as big as the value of the house Z to buyer X. Um, boy. Do we have a I'm actually confused. I'm a little confused about the sign. So if I flip the sign, if I flip the signs around, then I would have that minus P is less than UX minus XZ is bigger than minus VY minus CYZ. Um Maybe I flipped the sign on everything. Maybe it should be like that. Um, you know, maybe it was better before. Um, so somehow, let's see. So this is like the value that the buyer, the, the builder ends up with plus his costs. So the price has to be large enough to cover that. And it'll be equality for, so, uh, he'll never build. So when when strict inequality, he won't build those types of houses. He'll build the one that covers that exactly covers the value that he demands to get out of the market plus his costs for building the house. And the this inequality here says something like, um, oh yes, yes, mate, right. I'm starting to get it again, um, right. So you can you can mix these inequalities around again. So you can mix this inequality around and get right in the form u of x is bigger than axz minus pz and so it's also bigger than the soup over z of that and what this is saying is the value of this market to buyer x is um he'll choose the, the house which gives him the most happiness minus what he has to pay for it and so hit the value of the market to him is exact is at least that amount and if i did the same thing over here um i would have that vy is bigger than or equal to and in fact actually equal to the supreme over p over z of pz uh, minus cyz and this this set of inequalities says that the value to builder y is at least um he maximizes over houses he can build the price he would get for that house minus the cost to him to build it and what he'll get out of is at least that much and in fact at equilibrium equality holds in all these inequalities okay And if you want to sort of see, so I had sort of form one and form two. And so if you want to sort of see the equivalence between form one and form two, um, then what you need to do is recognize that when you take the maximizing gamma here, since there's no constraint on its Z marginal, um, all for given, if you take X, Y, and Z in the support of maxima, of a maximizing gamma. So let me go. Equivalence of form one to two. So let um, x, y, and z be in the support of gamma, gamma in argmax. Um, I guess it was a x z minus c of y z gamma x, y, z, where just the first two marginals of gamma are prescribed. 
Um, and then it's pretty clear that um, I, if the mat, so, so I claim that, that Z is then in the argmax. Um, so in other words, that, um, that uh, the benefit of XY will be exactly equal to A of XZ minus C of YZ. So when it, if this was not the case, so of course the benefit's always bigger than. But um, if, if Z didn't produce equality here, you wouldn't have this point in the support because you would take the mass at Z and you would move it to a point that did produce equality here. And then you would be able to increase this thing. And so you get a contradiction to gamma being the optimizer. So, calc so basically calculus of variations implies that, um, that the Z is gonna produce this. And so one way to, um, oh yeah, I, sorry, I made a, I did, um, maybe I better call this gamma tilde. So there's a confusion between a potential confusion between the gamma here that maximizes this guy and this gamma tilde that has three marginals. So gamma has two marginals, gamma tilde has three marginals. So one way to build a, a gamma tilde, which maximizes from a gamma, is you want to choose Z star X, Y in the argmax uh, of capital Z of AXZ minus C, Y, Z, and then set, um, and then you want to check that if you define gamma tilde, to be the push forward, I guess, of um, identity on X cross Y cross Z star push forward gamma, then this triple measure gamma maximizes, I don't know, let's call this star, star, star. Gamma tilde maximizes star, 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 if gamma maximizes star, star. So that's somehow the relation between the problem of double marginals maximizing B and the problem of triple marginals maximizing A minus C under constraints on just the first two marginals. And okay, so the, there's only one little subtlety that I wanted to remark, uh, which is that um, if this, this maximum here is not uniquely attained, then I need to choose Z star in such, I wanna be able to define this push forward. And so I would like Z star to be a measurable map. And um, so I wanted to just briefly mention measurable selection theorems. So, and the one that I'm always, so measure, there's a, there's a, there are different measurable selection theorems and they're pretty common. So the question is in this setting, do I have enough structure that I can choose a maximizer depending on X, Y that varies measurably as a function of X and Y. So the one that I use is the Kuratowski uh, real Nardzuski measurable selection. And it says something like, um, if XD is Polish, and I'm gonna let um, C bar, or no, that's not good, uh, closure denote uh, the set of closed sets. So C subset of X such that C is its own closure and it's also non-empty. And uh, then you have some other measurable space. So space with the sigma algebra.
omega s base omega with the sigma algebra f. And um, then you have a sort of relation. So you have a mapping, sorry, which takes omega to closed sets in X. And what you want is that um, for every is weakly measurable, so so called weakly measurable. I.e., um, for every open set U in X, what I call this thing, which by which I mean uh, basically the set of little omegas and capital omega such that F of little omega intersect, that's a closed set, it intersects this open set is non empty. I want that to be uh, Borel. So if you could, so here basically what I have is a map from omega, not to points in X, but rather to closed sets in X. And I'd like to, for each point, little omega and capital omega, I'd like to choose a representative of the closed set in X that it maps into. Then there exists um, mapping little f taking, uh, sorry, 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 not Borel is in f, script f. Um, then there exists a, a measurable, a, a map at little f from omega to x, such that um, f omega is in capital F omega for every omega, and a little f is measurable with respect to the With respect to the sigma algebra f on omega and the sigma algebra, the Borel sigma algebra on x. So that's a that's an example of a measurable selection theorem. And in the case, it applies in the case we're talking about uh, precisely because I assumed the spaces were Polish, and the functions were continuous. So, um, so, so how does it work in this setting? Um, you know, I have, I sort of have this product space down here. I have X and Y down here and I have Z up here. And first of all, because the functions are continuous, the set of maximizers a closed set. So the application. Um, let's call it capital Z star of X, Y equals the set of argmax. Um, so that part's good. It's non empty because, because these are because Z is compact. And so the only other thing that I need to check is, and of course the target, um, the target space Z is a Polish space by hypothesis. Um, we're gonna, for us, for us, I guess, omega is going to be equal to X cross Y. So it's also a Polish space and F is gonna be the Borel sigma algebra on X cross Y. Um, and so the only thing that I still need to check in order to do my measurable selection is that, uh, that I have this weak measurability property here. And on the other hand, so U here was gonna be, U is gonna be a 
subset of Z, it'll be open. The compactness of Z implies that U is sigma compact. So, so some of the picture is that I have like X, Y down here and Z up here, and I've chosen some open U, which is sigma compact. And then I have this mapping that takes each X, Y to the set of maximizing Z, which might look like that. There might be some X, Y's where you have many maximizing Z's, but you, have, you always have a closed set of them. And um, so this whole, the graph of Z star is a closed graph. It's a, so Z star is a multi-valued function, but it's graph. And so when you intersect it with this open cylinder, uh, it's all these spaces are compact. So this is a compact set intersect with this open cylinder. The intersection is also sigma compact. And when you project the sigma compact intersection down here, it has a so graph said star intersect x cross y cross u is sigma compact. Uh, hence, so is its projection onto x, y. And so in particular, it's Burrell. And that's all we needed. That's all we needed. And so then this measurable selection theorem that I just quoted says, aha, you can take that star measurable. And so this is this this is now well a well-defined operation that gets you from a maximizer to the two marginal problem with respect to B to a maximizer to the triple problem where two of the marginals are constrained. Is it clear? Are there any questions? All right, so that's that's essentially the story about ooh. Uh, the sign is wrong. Uh, I guess that's old. That's an old comment now. That's essentially uh, what I wanted to tell you about hedonic matching. Um, so now I guess I can switch to Wasserstein Berry centers. Um, so Wasserstein Berry centers have a kind of similar flavor. Uh, I'm going to do this in Rn, although I suppose you could do it in a, in a length space or a metric space. Uh, and so the idea would be I'm given mu1 up to mu k probability measures on Rn. And um, oh, yeah, in fact, maybe even before I do, yeah, okay. Uh, and constants lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda k, all bigger than zero. It's supposed to be capital K in both cases. Which add up to one. Uh, you would seek um, mu, which is the minimizer overall probability measures on Rn. Uh, let's say the sum as i counts from one up to k of lambda i and the Wasserstein two distance between mu and mu i squared. So let me see why is this a natural thing to do. So let's let's think about a simpler problem. If the Dirac, if these guys, if mu i is delta x i for every i up to k, then basically I'm seeking.
um, it turns out that this is solved by minimizing over points the sum as i counts from one to k of lambda i the distance between x and xi squared. And this is a simple, because the, because the lambdas are non-negative, this is a simple convex optimization problem on our end. So the minimizer x star satisfies, or maybe I should call it x lambda, I don't know, x lambda. Um, let's take a derivative of this. So the derivative says the sum of, as I counts from one with respect to X of lambda I X minus X I should equal zero. That's the first order condition. This is now X lambda here. Maybe, the, sorry, I don't like this notation so much. Let's put the lambda upstairs. And since the lambdas add up to one, i.e. X super lambda, is equal to the sum of the lambda i x i's. And so that's just a convex combination of the x i's. And it's what's usually called the Berry Center with weights lambda. I mean, you might you might worry. I, so I sort of skipped a step here because you, here I was talking about a minimum among measures, and here I'm, uh, I'm of course these are direct measures, but how do I know the minimizing measure mu is direct? But it turns out that it is. Like once you know where the xi's are and the weight, the best thing you can do is put, just like in the previous problem, uh, the best thing you could do was that uh, buyer x and builder y focus on a z that maximizes. It's, you might as well focus all of the mass of mu at the point that maximizes at the very center of these guys here. And also if you take, uh, it's a nice exercise to show that if you take, um, so this is a nice homework exercise. By the way, if you weren't here at the top of the hour, um, Somebody asked me for an extension on the problem set and I decided to, that I might as well give an extension. If I was gonna give it to one person, I might as well give it to everybody. So everybody has a two day extension on the problem set. Um, so here's a, a nice homework problem is to show that when K equals two, um, if you define X lambda to be arg min of, I guess it's one minus lambda D two of, Sorry, not x lambda, mu lambda. Um, mu, let's say mu zero, lambda d2 squared, d2, mu, mu one. That what you get out is the geodesic equation that, uh, in other words, D2 of mu lambda mu tau is gonna be exactly lambda minus tau of D2 mu zero mu one for every lambda and tau between zero and one. So somehow the k equals two version of this. So, and this is, this is a kind of a beautiful homework exercise, but it just uses the triangle inequality and stuff like a b is less than a squared plus b squared, or whatever that's called, completion of the square. Um, so the k equals two case generates geodesics. And the k larger than two k's generates what's called the very centers of these different points. Okay, so that's the Wasserstein Berry center problem. And this is it has a bit of the flavor of hedonic pricing, 
in this, except that instead of just a sum of two things, I have a sum of k things. But I'm still looking for, this is like the measure of houses that are going to be built. And these are like the marginals of the different buyers, builders, and other constraints. And so one place, so that, uh, let me just mention where, where all does this come up? So this Foster study very center comes up in statistics where um, they're different. So for example, when you wanna do um, applications, for example, character recognition, um, or you want to do interpolation between images. Um, so, you know, you have a bunch, you get a bunch of people, you look at uh, different people's um, handwriting. And so, you know, there are a bunch of different things that could be A's. And there's a different bunch of different things that could be B's. And so you have maybe 20, so you, you have 26 measures on images on the square or on images. And if you want to interpolate a little bit between these 26 characters, you can do you can use the Berry Center to construct something that interpolates between an A and a P and a Q. Or you could also look at optimization of the parameters. So if I have if some new image comes in and you want to figure out which one of these 26 images is it, you could ask, um, you know, what interpolation of these 26 images comes closest to your guy. And that would be a way of fixing 25 parameters. And then you'd say the probability that so. Um, so if a new measure, you could try to uh, select your vector lambda, which would be lambda one up to lambda 26, adding to one such that. Um, So given mu, given your new image, this is a sort of different problem, but you could select the lambda such that this thing is minimized given mu and your mu and also given mu one up to mu 26. This is PPR two, I guess. Um, you could read off the lamp after you minimize this. Uh, so minimize among lambda for fixed mu and mu i, you could read these things as being the probability that the new input is each of the given, uh, you know, is an A or a B. So if, if, if A, if lambda one is the largest, you'd read, uh, you'd say that this is most likely to be an A. Um, okay, so, so this is basically the, Wasserstein Berry Center problem. And uh, what did I want to say? I wanted to say that you can get, you can also think of this, there's a relation between Wasserstein Berry Center and multi marginal problems, which is analogous to uh, maybe I should just say what a multi marginal problem is. So, multi marginal OT, and then we'll stop. But there's, um, So e.g. given mu one up to mu k probabilities on Rn, you might want to seek uh, to minimize and uh, and a function I guess c on uh, which is maybe continuous on R and k. You might want to seek a joint measure on Rnk, which has mu1 as its first n marginals and mu2 as its second n marginals and so on. Um, the integral of c x1 up to xk d gamma x1 up to xk. And 
this has a natural dual problem, very analogous to the Kandorovich problem. So maybe I'll just write it down. It's, I guess, max over um, CX1 up to XK dominates UX1 plus UX2, U1, X1 plus U2, X2 plus UK, XK. And then it would be the sum of the integral of ui dui. And um, so an example, in fact, the first example class that was studied was the example cx1 up to xk is just the sum over, let's say, i different from j between 1 and k of xi minus xj squared. And it, this was studied, it was studied by various statisticians in the early 90s. And then there's a famous paper from the late 90s by Gangbo and Schweik, I think 1998, um, where they analyzed this problem and showed a little bit about it and the flavor of Mont uniqueness of solutions and characterization of solutions as living on a graph of the map over any one of the K variables, as long as one of the measures is absolute continuous with respect to Lebesgue. And it turns out that this multi-marginal multi transport with this particular cost is exactly linked to the Wasserstein Berry Center problem with this particular distance squared in the same way that the two forms of the Fichtonic pricing are linked to each other. So maybe that's, I'll, I'll sort of take it from there on Thursday. Um, but let me also point out that, um, that when we solve this maximization problem here, it's natural to look at the squares because it gives you this simple formula for the Berry Center. And if we'd looked at some other like piece power here, you would get some very non, the X lambda would depend on the X size in a nonlinear way. And so that's another way in which the quadratic exponent is natural here. And therefore you might ensure, infer that it's also natural up here. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, I'm gonna stop the recording now. And, uh,